his former clients, Michael Jackson and Harvey Weinstein, his current client, the biotech fund investor, Martin Shkreli, his origin story of chutzpah, who'd play him in a movie. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. Love. What does love mean to you? Depends on uh, what context you're asking. I've been married for uh, more than 50 years, so that's uh, wow. one, one example. I have uh, you know, love for my wife. I have love for my uh, children, grandchildren, and now I have a great-grandchild. So that's, uh, I think it begins and ends with family. You don't want to talk about my love of uh, the work I do, the Yiddish guy. Is it the most important thing in, in life? Well, family is, I think, mm -hmm. you know. Which is synonymous to love. Yeah. With you. So Martin Shkreli was this pharma bro that cooked the books, allegedly, in a very big pharmaceutical company that he was working with. And you famously argued that, don't put this guy away. He's on the verge of curing cancer of some sort, or he can cure cancer. And if you put him away, that would disrupt that. So... How do you come up with that kind of, that's brilliant. How do you come up with that kind of strategy? Well, it's not a strategy when you meet him. I mean, he's really a genius, and he's maybe the single smartest person I've ever sat uh, next to in a courtroom. I mean, picking a jury in that case was stunning because, you know, people had no hesitation about walking in, knowing nothing about him and saying, I really hate that guy, and I don't want to be on this trial, and, you know, they don't know anything about the case. The irony is, you know, the notoriety became... You know, because of the the raising by him of a you know a, a pill that you know helped uh, people with AIDS or by five thousand percent. Well, yeah, but you know the, the raise the price on people that is to say yeah, but by these, five thousand percent were, more than uh, what these necessary. were. You know, it it I don't want to you know I could talk forever about that case and I don't want to do it. But you know, he's now uh, been released yesterday and he's in a halfway house and the. The articles are, again, you know, they're not really filled with the crime he was sentenced for. And, you know, Martin Shkreli was acquitted of five out of the eight counts in the indictment. And he was found not guilty of the most serious uh, crimes in the indictment. And I think if he had just listened to me and stayed out of the news and stopped being, you know, uh, notorious in his own unique way, I think the judge would have given a substantially lower sentence. But... You know, he got remanded right after the trial, not because of the trial, but because, um, you know, he, he tweeted that anyone who wants to rip out, you know, the hair of Hillary Clinton and bring him a lock, you know, he would give them, you know, $5,000. Now, you know, I think, you know, the judge was convinced that that was very serious, and she wasn't concerned that Shkreli was going to do that, but he had a following, you know, he had... Uh, a cult-like following of, you know, thousands of people who she viewed as dangerous or crazy. And Secret Service came in and said, we've increased the security detail for uh, for the for Hillary. For Hillary Clinton. And, uh, you know, I've tried to convince him that words matter. He has certain issues that, you know, I'm not a good enough lawyer uh, to heal or control because I don't think it requires, you know, legal talent or experience. And, you know, I had to deal with it in the trial because, you know, he would not sit still. He would, you know, smirk and he would, uh, and the jurors were watching him. And I got up and, you know, and I said, I want to sing you a song without singing it that Lady Gaga wrote. You know, he was born this way. And, um, you know, I don't think I can do anything to change the way he was born, but I want you to think about the facts. And they stood up when they came back after five or six days of deliberation, and they said, you know, not guilty on five out of eight counts. Now, to be honest with you, that verdict was probably more amazing than any of the acquittals I've had because we took jurors who really hated him and convinced them to find him not guilty. Now, having said that, I think if he had just gone home and turned off his uh, Twitter feed and not gotten in the face of, you know, women he you know, really didn't like, and, and I think she offended, he offended the judge, and I think she gave him seven years. Now, my speculation is that he had just, had he just walked out of the courtroom after the trial and, you know, wounded but not, you know, killed, I think she might have considered a much lower sentence. Now, I don't know that, mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can point to, but when the verdict, you know, was finished, the judge, you know, was as stunned as, you know, we were, I think, and she, you know, she leaned down and she said, you know, I wish you good luck, Mr. Shkreli. Now, it's the first time I've ever had a judge say that 
you know, to somebody who was just found guilty of serious crimes. But, you know, he then, you know, three weeks later, he couldn't help himself. I mean, he started to, uh, you know, stalk a, a, you know, an attractive female reporter. And, you know, he uh, really started to bother her. And he said at one point, I really want to you know, have sex with you. And she said, you know, famously, I'd rather eat my own organs. That was her response. And, you know, two days later, he was uh, remanded. Now, in my profession, if you are remanded um, and a judge considers you to be a danger to the community... Hang on, remanded is that you reopen the case? Remanded, you know, he goes back to... He goes to jail immediately. You know, in most of my cases, you get found guilty. You get to voluntarily surrender. He would have been able to serve his sentence in a camp. That doesn't happen when you are, in effect, remanded as a danger to the community. Um, So the judge made certain findings that, you know, costing him camp placement. Mm -hmm. Now, he was in a low security facility, but the difference between, you know, uh, a camp and even a low facility is like the difference between a high school basketball team and the NBA. I mean, they're now both basketball teams, but it's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And... You know, he's now uh, come out. He's in a halfway house. But my hope and I pray that he doesn't screw this up because he's going to be on the supervised release Mm. for a number of years. Um, He's been ordered to pay $64 million in restitution. And he has been barred from the pharmaceutical industry for life. So, you know, these are punishments to him that are worse than, you know, a prison sentence. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to spend... uh, the rest of my time here just talking about him. I think it's an important case, but, you know, it's it's not my life's work. Of course. You've, we could spend a, a day here and, right. you know, there'd be the scratch of the service. But they must that must be so much more difficult for you in your position to control your clients nowadays as opposed to, let's say, when you first started practicing where you would just say, don't make any comments to the press, right. don't do anything in public. Now a guy just tweets something, and these people that you're representing have a level of notoriety and followers that it can make national news immediately. Right. But, but very few people have his following and his mm-hmm. uh, notoriety. And to be honest with you, I think uh, the press and the media is fascinated by him because he's... He's eccentric. And... He's eccentric. He's very smart. Mm-hmm. He's very talented. But he's also, uh, you know... Someone who has, uh, you know, issues, and I respect them, and I admire him in many ways, but, you know, I also am frustrated because, you know, he, you know, takes the agony we, uh, you know, we have worked on his case with, you know, sheer agony, and, you know, we almost pulled it it's off. bone crushing what you do, everything. That you- it was bone crushing work. You know, we, we had four lawyers in my firm work on that case, and, you know, if it wasn't for... Uh, the Sabbath, you know, I would work seven days a week. So I worked six days a week. But, you know, my staff in that case, uh, we had a million exhibits and documents and, and, and emails. And I remember sitting in the office with him on a Sunday preparing for trial. And I said, you know, Martin, I'm really, I'm really looking for an email that responds to this person and, and really shows that he wasn't defrauded. And he says... Uh, I think it's exhibit, you know, 2050 on an email on July 5th. I'm making up these numbers, but, and then I looked at it and he was right. It was, you know, he has photographic memory. He's uh, a brilliant Mm -hmm. kid and it's, it's sad. It's very sad. What makes you choose to be the person to do this? I understand that everyone's entitled to an attorney, but what makes you, Ben Brofman, the person that needs to be the one defending these people? people. I don't need to be that person. I think I am that person because I think I know how to do it. I think I've, you know, proven that I, I do it well and I haven't done it by sacrificing my own personal integrity or my own ethics. I mean, I've let people walk out of my court, walk out of my office, you know, who wanted me to interpose, you know, a defense on their behalf that would, you know, cause me to compromise my own, uh, ethics and my own integrity and you know they'd walked out of my uh, you know my office and I you know I've spoken about this to young prosecutors and you know they've mm-hmm. said well you know it's uh, you know I think that's not a big deal and I say yeah it's a big deal if someone walks out of your office with, when they were going to offer you a $500,000 fee yeah I think that's a big deal and I don't know that you would 
you know, have that, you know, integrity where mm -hmm. I say, you know what, I just don't want to do this. Is that what happened uh, with Michael Jackson? No, Michael Jackson was just, you know, uh, a very, very uh, bizarre young uh, person. And I think, you know, the thing that bothered me the most about walking away from Michael Jackson cases, I think I could have, obviously that case was an acquittal waiting to happen. And both Mark Garagos and I knew that. And, um, you know, I think Michael Jackson would be alive today if he had listened to me, because one of the reasons, you know, I was uh, essentially, you know, left that case is because I told his uh, family that unless Michael Jackson gets into rehab, and I'm talking about, uh, you know, locked rehab where he can't leave, I think he's going to be dead in a couple of years. Whoa. And I was right. I mean, he was abusing uh, um, drugs, as it turned out. And he was uh, sort of like a, a sad uh, story. I mean, it was like representing an 11 year old in a very serious case. I mean, Michael Jackson is, you know, one of the most talented, brilliant uh, musicians, dancers. I mean, I still love his uh, music, but, you know, it was, um, it was, the experience was enlightening, but it just wasn't uh, the kind of experience where I was going to be able to stay in L.A. for a couple of uh, months and uh why not i love la come to la come yeah, on I, I love la too and we'll I have, hang out i have relatives in la and i have uh and my me. son married a girl from la so it's right. it's uh you know a good place and it has uh a lot of good things uh going for me but there are also a lot of people there who i don't consider to be uh real you know the whole uh movie industry you know is filled with you know people who i you know think are plastic people they don't have the same uh values they don't have the same uh you know mindset and you know i i like what they do i think it's great but i'm uh, sure you'd represent all of them if they got into trouble well not all of them not but all some of them, them some yeah he <laughs> represented harvey weinstein he, yeah but point. harvey weinstein was also you know a, a case where but at one point you know harvey weinstein said you know i i, I want a skirt those were his words. I want a skirt to represent me. I said, Harvey, you know, I can do this. I can do a lot, but I can't become a woman before the trial. So if you want a skirt, I'm not the right guy. And, you know, he, he hired someone who, you know, convinced him that she was going to win the case. And, you know, and, and he got 23 years. So I think, you know, and she used the emails that I fought to get for three months, and I got them. And I think, you know, Harvey... Harvey's appeal is pending, and you know I don't want to talk about it because he's already said to me that if he wins a new trial and if they're going to try it again, he's going to want me uh, to represent him. He bemoans the fact that you know I wasn't part of the uh, trial team. Harvey Weinstein and I, you know, got along on a very, very uh, important level because he's a genius, a talented guy. He knows his craft, and I remember you know when I was sitting in my conference room with him and just talking about movies, I mean, he's just brilliant when it comes to movies, I think, you know. Well, you're biased. You love Pulp Fiction. I did love Pulp Fiction. And, you know, he, um, he made a lot of great movies. What can I tell you? He wasn't the creative guy. He was the money guy. No, he was a very creative guy, too, and a very talented guy. And, you know, when you say he was the money guy, I mean, you know, Hollywood and the movie industry is much more difficult than just coming up with a couple of million dollars, you know. Right, producing so, it and lining yeah, it all up and all he's that. A pretty, he was a pretty talented, brilliant uh, guy in many ways. But, you know, what can I tell you? You meet a lot of talented. I meet a lot of very interesting, brilliant, uh, talented people who, uh, you know, I have an interesting life. If I wanted to, you know, write a book, it would be, a, you know, bestseller. But, you know, I can't do it unless and until I retire and I don't see that in the near future. And I got to get... Uh, waivers from a lot of these people and i don't want to do it so <laughs> you know you don't want to go back in that capacity no i really don't i don't need to write a book you know yeah but you love what you do to some extent what yeah. does that mean to some extent it's it gets it's more grueling. difficult as you get older i mean it's a full-time hard job i run a big firm i mean big relatively in my in my work i have a you know a staff of you know 10 people that i pay every friday whether I make any money or not. I'm sure you could have scaled bigger. I'm sure that crossed yeah, your mind. Yeah, but that's, that's, you scale bigger, it doesn't work. Once you lose control of uh, the work. The quality yeah. goes down. Yeah, and I don't, I don't need to scale it bigger. I mean, I, I was wined and dined by headhunters a couple of years ago. Come to this firm. We'll give you a, you know, a, a guarantee, and you'll get 
And, you know, then as I began to discuss it more and more and more, um, you know, the, the people who wanted me to come there, I mean, they didn't have any, any conditions. You can write your own ticket. You can do that. I don't want to have a boss, and I don't want to answer to an executive committee or to a manager who's, you know, 25 years younger than I am. I just don't need that in my life at this point. You had, though, a boss in the beginning of your career. Love that story where you called up a big firm, you cold called a big firm, and the guy humored by your call says, all right, you know, come over for no, an interview. It wasn't, and it's Robert McGuire and Andy Lawler had the hottest uh, criminal defense firm uh, when I was in law school, and I followed them, and I, I knew a lot about their work, and, uh, you know, I had a conversation with McGuire, and, you know, he said to me... Off oh, a cold call, is that true? You know, I called him, and I said, I've read about this case, I have a great idea. So he said, well, you know, put your idea down on paper and send it to me. And I did, and the case got dismissed based on my theory. And then, you know, he said, that's great. When you come to New York, call me. Maybe we'll have lunch. So I maxed out my MasterCard. I was in Ohio, and I went to the airport. I called him that morning, and I said, uh, do you want to have lunch? He said, I thought you were in Ohio. I said, yeah, he was, but you told me to call you when I got to New York. It's so amazing. Went, yeah, but it's, the bravado, you know, the gumption. Right, but the I think through. the chutzpah is what I think intrigued him. And uh, he basically went to his partner and he said, uh, we got to hire this guy because I can't get him out of my office. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, they gave me a start. And because of them, uh, you know, I think I give them a lot of credit for what I've accomplished. I worked there for two years. And then one day, you know, I said to McGuire, I want to do what you do. I mean, I don't want to carry your briefcase. I want to be the guy... And he said, then you got to be a prosecutor for a couple of years. And he called up Bob Morgenthau and said, I got a guy you want to hire. And I went down and Morgenthau hired me. And two weeks later, I was an assistant district attorney. And I was sort of like, he put me in a rackets bureau, which, you know, 45 years ago was the elite trial bureau. And I tried more cases in the four years that I was there than the entire rackets bureau combined. And, uh, I liked it. Uh, I left there in December of 1980. I borrowed $15,000 from my wife's grandfather because I had zero money. And uh, he lent me $15,000. I got a desk and an and a electric typewriter. I hired a secretary and somebody gave me a, a room in a townhouse on East 74th Street. And it's, it was great because if you came into the building, you know, you'd think I owned the building. You'd think I just... <laughs> rented a room and you know <laughs> it was great i mean i and uh three months later i gave her grandfather back the money and he looked at the check and he said no one who has ever borrowed money from me has <laughs> paid the money back i said well you know i'm the exception to the rule and then uh, i started trying a lot of cases and uh you know people say yeah well you tried a lot of cases involving you know organized crime and i said well you know in those days those were the only trials and if you look at the cast of lawyers in those cases, they're among the, you know, the people with the best reputations in New York. And, you know, they sort of made room for me. And, uh, you know, in those cases, you could cross-examine 50 people in six weeks, and I became good at it. And then, you know, you get an acquittal, and you get another acquittal, and people start, you know, who is this guy? And, you know, mm. and then, uh, you know, it took off from there. The sex cases, you come up with a defense, it's easy. It's like... He said, she said. Those are easy cases to win. It's not easy. In today's world, you know, the, mm. the, the advantage still is, you know, the she said. And, you know, it's, it, it's not as easy as you make it sound. Many of these cases involve, you know, two young, attractive people who meet at a club. They both get completely drunk. They go back to their apartment or his apartment or her apartment. They have sex. In the morning, there's regret generally by the, by the woman. Um, she got to explain this, and, you know, she doesn't want to have to explain it. And I remember talking to a uh, a woman who was, you know, chief of the Sex Crimes Bureau in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and um, her husband now works for me because she was, you know, very impressed by my approach. And, you know, she said, you know, I think, you know, you and my husband are the best, uh, you know, criminal lawyers in America. And she was right, you know. Uh, and he works, he's now worked for me for more, almost 15 years. Mm. But I remember saying to her, I says, you know, I, I got to tell you something. In this case that we're talking about, you have convinced me that um, she was too drunk uh, to say no. And how about my guy? How did he know that she is too drunk to say no when he was too drunk to even understand the nature of the relationship? You look at the receipt from the club. 
they both had, you know, 10 drinks and, you know, they were falling down drunk. You know, I think the video shows them neither of them could stand. Mm. They go back to, you know, to his apartment. They have sex, which he thinks and believes is consensual. Mm. And the next morning she has, you know, regret. What about him? You know, Mm. how does he know that she's, you know, too drunk uh, not to be able to, you know, understand what's going on when he's too drunk to understand what's going on? So, you know, where is your proof beyond a reasonable doubt? And, you know, she said to me, that's a pretty interesting argument. And, uh, well, yeah, maybe that works in a one, one-off one situation, but for a guy like Harvey Weinstein, where there's like yeah, multiple... Yeah, but Harvey things, Weinstein not... is a unique case, and it's an exceptional case. Mm-hmm. But even in Harvey Weinstein's case, you know, some of the women who claim he raped them, uh, you know, have months and months of emails going back to him, you know, basically not complaining and not bemoaning the fact. And, you know, if you're a young starlet in Hollywood and you're very pretty and looking to break in and there are a thousand people who are just like you, you know, having sex with Harvey Weinstein separates you from the 999 people you're competing with. And, you know, he understood that. I'm not saying, you know, he's completely uh, naive or he's completely innocent, but the women who testified against him at the trial, I mean, if you saw their emails, you would say, this is like stupid. You know, one of the women who claims, you know, he raped her, there's an email saying, you know, my mom's coming to town tomorrow, I'd like you to meet her. You know, who introduces their mother to someone who, you know, raped her? You know, mm-hmm. it just, it just, uh, so I think that case is unique. But I think that case, to be honest with you, uh, was winnable. Sure. And we don't need to talk about Harvey specifically, but just in general, if someone were to be in that position, it doesn't seem contradictory to me. It doesn't seem mutually exclusive to do something like um, have a mom and, you know, invite a mom over because I can't get into the head. I can't get into the head. It's Harvey Weinstein. I can't get into the head, but it it could still be non-consensual. It could still be. Right. But I don't, I'm, I'm talking, you're not talking about is he a good guy? Is what he did, you know, morally defensible? You're talking about proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And to be honest with you, that's a pretty high standard. And in that case, I'm not certain that mm-hmm. they had proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm-hmm. Right. You're not the morality police. You're I'm just not. a criminal defense I'm attorney. Not. And, you know, I'm not the morality police. And I don't think anybody should be the morality police if it's, you know, if someone is uh, accused of a very serious crime. They should. Uh, be guilty and the government should be able to prove it beyond mm-hmm. a reasonable doubt. And if you have a doubt for which you can give, uh, you know, a good reason, then the, the verdict has to be not guilty. I've had a lot of people who were found not guilty who were not technically innocent. So the standard isn't, I find you innocent. That's never been the standard. Then how can it be the standard? And, you know, the charge that a judge gives, you know, someone, a jury in a, in a criminal case, often contains, you know, language in, in terms of, you know, state of mind. You know, it's not what, you know, my cases, many of my cases mm-hmm. involve state of mind uh, defenses. It's not what happened, it's why did it happen. And if you... Make that concrete, what do you mean by that? Well, if someone is charged with, you know, committing, uh, you know, bank fraud, you know, did they intend to defraud the bank or mm-hmm. were they not smart enough to understand the accounting issues that are required to fill this form out, you know, intelligently. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I have an accountant, and sometimes the accountant says, sign this and and, and pay this, and I do it. Now, have I sat down and tried to understand exactly what the law is with respect to that? No, I I don't, but I'm trying not to have the IRS involved in my uh, business. It's just not worth it. At the end of the day, I haven't really met a lot of people who by the time the case is over, between the aggravation and the family issues and the, you know, business loss and the reputation loss, that they believe that what they did was worth it, regardless of how much money they were mm, trying to right. make. And, you know, it's, it's true. I'm mindful of your time, so just a couple more questions. I'm mindful of your time, so just a couple more questions. The work that you've put in, you've outworked everybody, you're doing 14-hour days when you were a Manhattan district attorney, and then just in general, you've just been outworking the rest of the pack. What does that give you? What knowledge does that give you? Describe the experience of outworking. The, the, like, what, is, what does it teach you? What, it teaches what do you me have to run any shortcuts and that in order to be exceptional mm-hmm. uh, at your job. It's also taught my kids. 
you know, a very important lesson. Because when I was uh, trying cases, I mean, I have a table in my kitchen, which is, you know, almost bigger than this table, which we're sitting at. And, you know, at the time I was doing this, you know, you didn't have a lot of uh, technology that helped you. I had thousands of pieces of paper that I had to read and understand. And But also, you know, my kids would wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and come down to get, you know, a glass of juice or a glass of milk. And they'd see me, you know, sitting there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I would say to them, just remember, you know, there aren't any shortcuts. And, you know, it made an impression, Mm. I think. And, you know, I made them, it it made them become better people. You're literally known for being one of the best cross-examiners. You know, I, if you want to ask me what I think is my uh, best um, experience as a criminal defense lawyer is um, doing a cross. And when it works, it's a very good feeling. It's sort of like... Uh, you had an incipient smile as you said that. You're like well, flooded but it's, with the it's, you know, I'm now 73 years old and I've been doing it, you know, for more than 40 years on both sides. And uh, you know when something works. It's like, you know, when you're doing an interview. If it's a good interview, you feel it. This is a great interview. So, well, all right. So why is it a great interview? Because I'm a good interviewer, but you're asking good questions. Mm, okay. Thank you. Last question. So things that are created to be addictive like we saw the opium crisis uh they had known that these things that these pharmaceuticals that they were creating were addictive where does it draw the line between criminal and non-criminal let's say in the sense of social media where they're obviously engineering these things to rob you of your attention so that the only thing you're focusing on is this thing where do we draw the line as a society in your mind between the criminal and the civil or or even putting this on the spotlight? Like, why does one thing get precedence? And do you think that there's a case maybe to be made that TikTok is destroying the youth for sucking away all of their... Yeah, but TikTok and, and opium, uh, you know, it's like, you know, one's in the hula bowl and one's in Yankee Stadium. I mean, you know, you can't compare them. That's sort of like apples and oranges. Mm-hmm. And TikTok, if, if you're listening, Ben Brofman is your guy. Right, but if, you're, if you are, uh, you know making a drug that is, you know, terribly addictive. Doctor. But why isn't this a drug? This is a drug. What does that well, mean? Well, but like it's a, not the same. You're just picking it up without even thinking about right, it. Right, but you're... it's not the same. I, I lecture to high schools, and I, I talk about texting, and I talk about emails, and, you know, there is something to be said for, you know, screwing up your life by sending a text without thinking about what's in there and what's on it. And, you know, one of the things I say is once you hit send, it's forever. You know, you take a picture of yourself naked and you send it to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. You know, then when you break up, they have your picture forever. And if they hate you and they send it to everybody in your class, your life is ruined. And then 40 years later, you're being, you know, interviewed to become a federal judge and they find the picture. You're not going to get the job. So I think if you're 15 and you do stupid stuff, I think you need to do, you need to know sometimes it comes back to haunt you. If you do drugs and, you know, you die... You don't get a second uh, chance. And then if you're, you know, head of a pharmaceutical company and you're making something that is, you know, very destructive and has the ability to destroy uh, someone's life and you're doing it because the greed factor is so important to you that you just can't stop, I think you need to understand that sometimes it comes with consequences. But every, every case is different. You know, I have been in pharmaceutical cases where, you know, the drug of choice is not necessarily something that has the potential for killing you or screwing up your life or ruining your mind. Those cases are generally handled in a civil forum. But if someone, you know, ODs on your drug and it happens, you know, 50,000 times around the world, you know, you should sit up and take notice of that fact and maybe decide... Now look at the Theranos trial that, you know, went on with pharmaceutical companies. You could have gotten her off that, though. Well, but the pharmaceutical companies, for the most part, you know, help people. They don't necessarily destroy lives. So eh, we could agree to disagree on that. But. Yeah, but I think on the, on, for the most part, most of the work done by, you know, research uh, companies, you know, really end up saving lives. Mm. And sometimes they... They do it well, and sometimes they don't. Mm. But, you know, it's a topic for another, you know, sure. discussion. Then. This has been amazing. You, you, you don't understand how cool this is for me because, okay. yeah, as a young lawyer, I'm, young I'm Jewish I'm delighted lawyer, that we met, and I'm delighted that uh, you found it uh, helpful. And I did. I really who, did. Who gets to watch this? 
Um, mostly young lawyers, right. I mean, people that are following my account. So I have a bunch of young professionals that are watching it. Your fans. Okay. If they make a movie out of you, I'd like to play you or of some, okay. some sort. I'd like to play myself in that movie. <laughs> okay, fine. Who could play me better than me? <laughs> Nobody. Right? Nobody. Nobody. Right. So but I'll, I'll play young you? No. no. I'm, I'm, I can be young. You just, you know, touch Right, up CGI. They, the they have that done already. Okay. Robert De Niro played himself like three different ages right. in a mob movie. Right. Thank you for everything you've done for... I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. What do you mean you don't think the prison system works? Well, I don't think there's any, um, any rehabilitation mm -hmm. of uh, people with the exception of some. I don't think society has to essentially lose these people, and I think you do lose them when they're incarcerated. 95% of the people I represent are really very nice people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have obviously screwed up, but they wouldn't need me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think most of my uh, greatest successes um, nobody reads about because when I get into a case before someone is arrested or indicted, you know, very often I try to convince the government that they're wrong, that the person who is being targeted um, really never intended to violate the law.